we'll talk about ZFS to people have specific things they want to talk about. I'd, I'd prefer not to just me talk the whole time. This is supposed to be a birds of a feather session. <laughs> but uh, if you just want to ask questions, we can do that too. We have quite a panel of experts in the room. So, Because I'm pointing at you. <laughs> <laughs> So are there any specific topics people want to start with? Dan has a question. I want to know about really good snapshot management. So there's stuff that will snapshot my stuff, but not all my stuff, but only the stuff I want to snapshot, and when I want it, and for how long I want to snapshot. So for just snapshots, ZFS tools is pretty good. Uh, yeah, it, say. it lets you manage it with um, ZFS properties, so you set it on the root, it inherits everywhere, but you can override it for specific children. So you can say, snapshot my whole pool except for this one, this one, and this one. Is that the name of the tool? ZFS tools. ZFS tools. It's uh, in the Fort Street. It's the one we recommended in the, the ZFS book. Is ZFS uh, snap not a thing anymore? Or what's that? ZFS snap? Or, or ZF snap or whatever? Th that's still there too. Uh, there are a couple different ones. I'm, I'm sorry, what book was that? Uh, FreeBSD Mastery ZFS. Not all of them. There's copies in the hallway. <laughs> who, who wrote it? Michael Lucas. <laughs> uh, there's also FreeBSD Mastery Advanced ZFS, which has tuning recommendations for Postgres backups, even BitTorrent, because it turns out BitTorrent uses a, about a 16K record size, and so if you don't, have to do a read, modify, write cycle on, on sub parts of the block, you'll get much better torrent performance over the network too. So I have two quick questions. Yes. Suzanne, I was writing with ZFS tools. Oh. Don't you already I have both the other books? I can't hear the repeating, so everyone else hears it. Yeah. I'm sure they heard it. It was <laughs> FreeBSD Mastery ZFS and FreeBSD Mastery Advanced ZFS. Got it. Well, so both of which are oh, yeah, okay, right for back. sale in the hallway. The, the torrent block size, yes, but the I.O. from the client, it depends on the client, but most of them are 16K. Uh, and so if the default record size on ZFS is 128K, you're, you most, I mostly noticed it when I was, you know, doing torrents, to, saving them to my NAS, but the torrent client was running on my other machine, and I noticed a lot of reading going on instead of just writing. And I was like, that shouldn't be the case. I noticed things got a lot better when I, um, in, in our torrent, there's a recipe you can specify that says when you're finished the torrent, copy the whole thing over here. Yes, that's one of the other reasons. Uh, you, uh, What we recommend in the book is creating a data set where you download stuff into, and especially with torrents where you're downloading out of order, and then when it's finished, you move it to the other data set, and it basically defragments it for you, because it writes it in order in that case. Yeah, almost every torrent client supports this automatically. That's yes, that's yes, that's those are the two books then. Because they're little copy instead of move. Yeah, so uh, you could, yes, you could do it that way. But in general, what you want when when you're storing it for long term, you want to use a much larger record size, like the default 128k, or I, I like one megabyte. For especially for video content and so on. Yeah, so your incoming data set, you want a small record size so that you can do your random writes and, and not have to do uh, rewriting. But for storage, you want to use a large record size because, you know, uh, for our large video workload with 60 ish terabytes of data written with one megabyte blocks instead of 128K blocks, we get about six terabytes in space savings because you're writing, you know, 7x less metadata, right? And then so. Uh, the other thing I have to show off a little bit is I have a almost finished implementation of Z standard, Facebook's new compression algorithm for ZFS. 
Uh, with the default settings for Z standard, uh, the base system of FreeBSD compresses at 2.65 to 1, and the source tree at 2.82 to 1. Although, if you use the max setting in Z standard, you can get over 3x to 1. Um, it is slower than LZ4, but it's still much faster than your hard drive. <laughs> so, you will actually, uh, it, when you write to the one with, when you set the Z standard compression to maximum, you will definitely notice. So, would it be worth it to even use the three and then the AD? Um, mostly. Um, so, with Z standard on the regular setting, not the extreme setting, uh, your compression speed is four to 500 megabytes per second per core. So at that point with NVMe, maybe it depends on how many cores you have, whether that's enough. Um, but the decompression speed is 1200 plus uh, megabytes per second per core. Uh, so it can make a reasonable difference. And you know, compared to LZ4, so LZ4 on the base system, you're getting 2.07 to one. Uh, and with, L, uh, with Z standard on not extreme mode, you can get 2.8 plus, and at max you can get over 3x. And that's the base system, which is you know a bunch of binaries and the source is mostly text, but uh, you know on databases where it's pure text and very compressible repetitive data, you can get really nice ratios. And then when you combine that with compressed arc uh, with high ratios, it means I've got over three gigs of data in the arc, but I'm using only 986 megs of RAM to store it. And, you know, imagine that with your database, right? <laughs> so what the arc does is, well, George can answer this better, but it keeps the block as it was compressed on disk in RAM and then decompresses it as you use it instead of ever deciding to try to compress something that's already in RAM or something like that. So all it's doing is delaying the decompression until you actually use it out of the arc each time instead of before it puts it in the arc. And then the, the, the compression algorithm, depending on how you load it, so if you load it originally again with LZ4 and then went to a Z standard, next time you use it again, it's going to reduce the delay compression. Okay. So it also works nicely if you, say, compress some files with LZ4 and some with Dead standard, you will end up with both, you know, whatever one you compress it on disk with is what it stays compressed with in RAM. Matt and I solved the last problem with it uh, during before the last talk, so hopefully uh, in the next couple of months. I hope to have it in FreeBSD in time to present it at the uh, Open ZFS Dev Summit. And then it should be. Based on my patch currently, it should be pretty easy to upstream into OpenZFS. With FreeBSD, you get a first go at it. Yes. Right. As, as is the standard model for OpenZFS, it goes in somewhere first, and once it's been used in production for a while, it goes upstream, right? Let Matt finish chewing and he will answer that question. Uh, So, no, I've looked through the code with an eye to what would it take to get to FreeBSD. It's, it looks like it'll mostly land nicely. Um, we have the option of either trying to port the Illumos Cryptos framework or crypto framework to FreeBSD like uh, they did for Linux uh, or using our existing open crypto framework. I'm biased towards using the open crypto framework because I know how it works and it will be less work than 
reporting something. Um, the encryption on ZFS uses two different, uh, your choice of two ciphers, uh, AES GCM or AES CCM. Open Crypto Framework doesn't have an implementation of CCM yet, but I've been nagging some people and hopefully it will. Separate feature flags would help. Uh, it would mean we could have it sooner instead of having to wait till we have CCM. Um, but yeah, that would be advantageous for us. Other questions? Things people want to talk about? So FreeBSD to open ZFS's repo is almost 100% parity. Um, I don't think we've imported uh, the ADB stuff yet. But <coughs> yeah. yeah, it hasn't been merged yet. Yeah, other than that, we're pretty close. Um, Yes, uh, so Linux is a little further behind and they have some stuff that's pending or, or merged there that's not upstream back to OpenZFS yet. And that's why Matt had all the <laughs> right foresight to come up with feature flags uh, to deal with this situation because if we still had version numbers, we would all be in trouble. Fletcher. Yes, so if, if somebody wanted to get the ISAL crypt dash crypto version of ASGCM into FreeBSD, that would be great. And CCM while you're at it. Yeah, I tried to get that up to date on the wiki a little bit better, but I don't know what's going on in some other. Yeah, I don't know about the I updated the version of FreeBSD it listed because it listed some ones that aren't supported anymore. <laughs> but I, I, I didn't compare it to Linux and, and you know, the ZFS on Linux is 
sometimes an interesting question because there's what's in ZFS on Linux head and then there's like, you know, what's in the version that Ubuntu shipped with their long-term support release and so on. <laughs> and, you know, we don't want the table to get too big either. Right, uh, so uh, I don't have the presentation handy, but uh, I did a presentation in January about the state of the OpenZFS port in FreeBSD. Almost everything that's gone into OpenZFS has been in FreeBSD head within about 30 days. Uh, I think the record one was 14 hours between the commit to OpenZFS and the commit to FreeBSD head. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the worst one was the extra hashing algorithms. Uh, the code for it all went into head uh, within 30 days, but because we didn't have implementations of a truncated SHA-512 or of Skyne or even R, they were just if-deft out, uh, and the feature flags weren't enabled on FreeBSD. Uh, after 190 days or so, I got around to doing it. <laughs> so I implemented, uh, I took a, a version of Colin Percival's SHA-512 and, and made the truncated version and, and tested against the known answer tests and so on. So on FreeBSD, we have uh, SHA-512 truncated and Skyne. Uh, we do not have Eden R. Um, there were some concerns about the security of it and the license. I have a copy where I've been granted the right license for it, uh, but I've never got around to implementing it. Uh, Blake 2 is not upstream. But if somebody wants to do that work, uh, the OpenZFS is a great thing to work on. Um, it's, it's, it's in 11, and I'm pretty sure you can even boot from it on FreeBSD, which is not the case on most of the other OpenZFS. Well, I, it is on Illumos now because they ported the FreeBSD bootloader. And it was the person porting it to Illumos who made Sky and work on FreeBSD too, <laughs> Thomas Soon. Other questions, things people want to talk about? I've got a, a small request for um, just to almost every request administrator to jump in front and to get an email to send a push mail with um, a screen uh, of the video request for the SPS rather than the mirror. Um, right. So you have got the SPS. You probably just started this week off as the first time and you really, really, really don't want to do this because you It already it. says that. If you try to do it, it says you should mix VDEV groups, but if you really know what you're doing, you put minus F, and everybody puts minus F and then does it anyway. <laughs> and ZFS is like, I told you so. But, but Matt has already, well, there's one feature that fixed. The reason I'm talking about this one is this example. Okay. So if you meant to add it as a mirror, and you added it as a screen grab, then you didn't have to attach the other side of the mirror. But if you added that VDEV and you added that as a screen grab, then you A stripe. Like, like, like mix them in USB drive and make the mirror attach to the mirror. That's what that's the way I did stuff. So you wanted you had an uncorrected one, you wanted to make it a mirror, yeah. but instead you added added it as like extra storage, extra uncorrected storage. Right. 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 So there's a couple of different things here. First, when you do the Z pool add or attach, if you put the minus N flag, it prints the layout without actually doing it. Yeah. You should always do that first. But anyway. Oh, right, yes, because it, yeah. it was already yeah. uncorrected, you're adding another uncorrected one, so it's like. It assumed that's what you meant. Yeah. 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 Uh, so we have uh, zpool snapshots or checkpoints now. So you can create a, if you create a checkpoint before you do an operation like that, you can undo it. Yeah. Uh, and then separately, device removal, right?
Yeah. I actually watched it happen at a demo at a conference once. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they were trying to add a, uh, a, a slog and they added it as a, a, a stripe, yeah. unprotected yeah. device yeah. to the end of the mirror, yeah. <laughs> or to the end of a, a bunch of mirrors. And it was like, uh, whoops, <laughs> that device isn't the right size <laughs> or the right <laughs> kind. Of, yeah. Uh, so the replication script, which I didn't write but have been maintaining since the person who wrote it for OpenSolaris moved on or whatever, uh, really needs to be thrown away and started over. <laughs> uh, so the, the big need we have right now is that Matt finally got around and we got uh, resumable replication and, uh, and, so, and bookmarks, which lets you uh, do incremental replication without having to keep the old data on the source. Um, None of the replication tools I know of use either of those features. And they're like the most compelling features for replication. Uh, and so, you know, when I'm doing a really big job, which I do fairly re frequently when I back up, you know, 200 terabytes of data across a metro link, uh, I do it by hand currently because I really want the resume support. <laughs> um, and I've actually had to resume a, co a couple times. Um, and the resume feature works very nicely and is quite compatible with scripting. It's just nobody's written the script for it. Uh, for ZX, for the main, uh, the way it works really is it does a ZFS list on the source side and a ZFS list on the destination side and compares them, figures out which snapshots are missing and replicates them individually. Uh, so it doesn't use like ZFS send minus capital R. It figures out, all right, you know, you need this snapshot for that data set and these two snapshots for this data set and copies them over. It also has the option of being like, oh, if a snapshot has been deleted on the source, I'll also delete it on the destination uh, so that, you know, you can prune old snapshots. Although it has grandfather protection where you can say, if a snapshot is older than X days, leave it on the destination because I maybe want to keep the really old one on there but not on the source. Uh, it works okay. It has a couple of problems. Um, sometimes, because it does each of these commands over SSH, so it makes a fresh SSH connection to do each ZFS command, it can be a little slow. <laughs> uh, and um, the other problem it has is if the SSH connection goes wrong, sometimes it thinks the list of snapshots on the other side is blank, which then it means it decides to delete all the snapshots and you have to start the replication over. I find ZFS hold is really handy for that one. Uh, it's like this one snapshot should never go away. <laughs> it's the basis of my replication. Uh, it'd be really handy if it had the ability to optionally replicate holds as well, uh, which was a patch I tried to do for ZFS before, but decided I did it wrong and need to start over. And is the, uh, the ground is right for? Yes. Uh, I bought a domain for the, the I picked a name and bought a domain for the script I wanted to write, <laughs> and I've not finished writing the problem statement yet. <laughs> the, 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 the three year or two year registration on the domain will expire in a few months. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Zorro.sh is mine <laughs> if I ever get around to writing it. Uh, one interesting one that Will Andrews uh, found was the task queue or something that's used uh, in ZFS means that the number of ZFS sends you can have running concurrently is limited to the number of CPUs you have. If you start more than N send operations when you only have N CPUs, the additional ones sit there using no CPU time and waiting until one of the other ones is finished. Uh, I'm not, I don't think it's, 
Uh, it just reuses some existing task queue or something for the work, and it's not scaled. Will found it, but what's that? I don't know if that's specific. It might be FreeBSD specific, but I don't think so. Okay. Uh, it only really came with, most of my storage servers have many CPUs and it was fine, but the one that I was using as the source for uh, TrueOS's ISO images only has four CPUs. And there are 12 mirrors that are each trying to sync all these snapshots at once. And then you just see this interesting thing where there's a whole, like eight ZFS sends are running. Four of them have CPU time. The other four have used zero seconds of CPU time and they just sit there waiting. And then one of these finishes, the next one starts going. Uh, and I just wondered if you know we could make a tunable so we could control what that number would be instead of just auto tuning to the number of CPUs. Yeah, I assume the narrow that would really allow me to control what one of the options to do a single Yeah, that's in general for that you just need the right tool like BBCP or something <laughs> or T. <laughs> um, I remember uh, so I was at a talk, I think it was two years ago, um, and there was, um, I don't think it was with UCL, but there was <coughs> somebody was going uh, across all the tools in the space and uh, making, them, uh, making them support uh, clean readable. Uh, LibXO. LibXO, that's it, yeah. And then, uh, and then so there was, he talked about the ZFS tooling uh, and integration with that, and then the last that I checked, um, still couldn't get. So, yeah, um, the ZFS tools are the best tools to get machine-readable output that I've ever seen, but uh, to get JSON and so on. There is a pull request in the ZFS on Linux repo to add JSON output, uh, and because of that, I didn't ever do the one with Libzo. Um, in particular, I, I don't think, I don't know if Illumos is interested in LibXO in the base system for Illumos. I don't know have, who I'd have to have that conversation with. Maybe it wasn't a task group. I forget about it. Was. Uh, was or it didn't happen. Okay. <laughs> I think what makes uh, LibXO more interesting I think than Illumos is here is some of the work that's also happening in the space. So mm -hmm. if, if both of those can combine and having you know, machine intelligible output from multiple tools, I think we're going to be using quite a bit in this area of work. Cool. I haven't looked at how the output is generated for some of that stuff in ZFS and how much work it would be to libzillify it. Um, although I think the, the text output model of ZFS is something that every author should strive to have their tool be like. Being able to choose the columns you want and how they're sorted <coughs> and it's, it's What was the other one somebody managed to put in? Yeah. There was something somebody put in a path name that was evil. I forget what it was. No. Other questions? What does Bjorn want to ask about ZFS? Uh, maybe it's going to look like they have <laughs> Never. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to lose your data, use ButterFS. <laughs> I have a disk subsystem question I'd like to pose it. We can try to help you. Two of them failed last week, and I upgraded them to four terabyte drives. 
Now the controller for that plex is um, an LSI variant that Fujitsu manufactures found on eBay, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. I'm running it with the FreeBSD's pass-through mode, so the MFI pass-through is mm -hmm. one. Geon sees the disk as exactly two terabytes, so bigger than a two terabyte disk usually is. But if I send CAN control um, capacity to it, mm -hmm. it says four terabytes. Now it's in pass-through mode, so the size of the MFI, you know, if it's broken and can't see four terabytes, should that matter? Is, is there a way that I can just convince Geon to go with the four terabyte size and I can obviously at least see with CAN control Probably in the storage controller. I, I don't know. Well, again, if it's, mm -hmm. it's in pass through mode, is there a way I can convince? I think there are several different MFI, MFI variants, and there are some possibilities that you know, but I'm not sure how much possibility would you. Well, it's, it's the kernel parameters. Like MFI pass through equals one, and then you have to put it in the, in the loader.com. Has to be there to boot. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, want it to pass through anyways because it takes a whole gigabyte out of the disk most of these MFI variants that, that you've identified in Korea so the disk is the disk shows up as a DA not an MFID and that's why I'm saying why can't you know if, it, if CAN is obviously talking to it relatively directly why can't CAN get its own size well, CAN, can, can support all possible ways to detect size size too so mm -hmm. possibly it's not just exactly plus two maybe when I say can control capacity, it comes back and says it's four terabytes. Right, but that's just it asking the drive how big the drive thinks it is, not how big the storage controller is telling you it is. Right? I'd like to see this. This should not happen. We can talk about uh, capacity of four terabytes, should be four terabytes. There are no other terms of proof. There are, there are two different formats to read capacity. I read capacity 10, I read capacity 15 in Kali. Some broken devices, they can somehow report different things. Maybe it won't happen in your case. But well, maybe afterwards I just log in. I, you know, obviously it's offline. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> the previous question about tabs. Tabs are not allowed in data summary. Um, also, weird, other weird characters are not allowed. Only alphanumeric spaces, colons, dots, underscores, and dashes. Ah, that's the one. You can name a data set dot or dot dot. <laughs> <laughs> that's evil. <laughs> no emojis. That's true. What? No emojis. Alt space. Yeah. <laughs> what do you do some of the old school emojis? Yeah. 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 Well, there was a time that um, removing uh, F log device uh, wasn't a good idea. Yeah. Uh, when, when your stuff is running in hot. So you mean like hot removing it or asking ZFS well, politely, politely to remove it? Politely okay. to remove it. Um, and, and or say hot removing it. Um, so recently I've been looking at like uh, what's, what is an appropriate F-Log device? Like boot battery back um, or like you know, uh, faster back stuff. Uh, like a requirement at this point still? Or is that kind of it's okay to run with uh, you know, not, not any not With S log. <laughs> no, I was just thinking some of the like SSDs would work fine, but you may be like you know you've got some space to be able to put your internal like your own SSD. So it's not that and, and so when I'm saying consumer grade, I'm thinking like Samsung uh Chrome two fifty or something like that. So I'm not a fan of Chrome fifty, but <laughs> um, we've seen a lot of issues with uh the post that seems to raise they advertise five point five blocks and 
under heavy heat conditions, they will actually be turned down to starboard. And uh, you know, most of the time it's non-fatal because DSS has within the pipeline has the heat trial mechanism. So if it doesn't fail the first time and it's retried the second time, it should be quite fatal. Mm -hmm. um, we have found that with compression mass, if you actually force more heat pressure, and that seems to alleviate a lot of the load processing that's done by the Pretty important. <laughs> Best record. So in my old lot, when we try to try and go five twenty, we kill them. That's more. They're more or less water. You can handle them. But uh, five thirty is now. It's terrible. You even if you use the main storage, it's slow. But for end flow, it's unimaginably slow. You just push them in time, and it's like turning on elevator. That's why it works at least twenty. Because I don't know how they find out. <coughs> also, the page numbers are perfect. Can you talk a little bit about using NV dims for S log or not uh, yet? Uh, I did some measurements just uh, recently. So I compared uh, two SATs and NV dims, like for comparison. So uh, I, I compared it to some Micron SSD, S6 <coughs> Enterprise, but Micron. And I got something. And I compared the RG HDC, also a fast one, and the difference was like about three to two and a half to three times the performance between those two. So both are fast, both are uh, enterprise, but like three times different. And NV Dim was like three to four times faster than the, the fast of those two guys. Mm -hmm. And what the measure was in DSS, it was like quite complicated in either pipeline, mm -hmm. uh, what was there, and it obviously could be optimized, but that's what we can now. So I was testing like a worst possible case of three tolerance, or worst possible from uh, commit time mm. for the user. So I uh, shortest transaction, I added the transfer of transfer from 512 bytes up to the power of six, up to several megabytes. Mm -hmm. And uh, in almost every point, uh, NVD was like four, three to four times faster than uh, enterprise SSD. Yeah. Yeah. Start with SSD. Maybe NVD could use some more NVD, but some optimization uh, for trade and pipeline, especially uh, so I did some minor optimization, it's trivial but sufficient for case of uh, when commit is involved from a diesel IO. Uh, in that case, uh, you, you can commit directly from a certain of shares, not go into a of switch here and there. Mm -hmm. But in, uh, in case of the modern one, uh, it was a record first, that's why I could still go to pipeline and have two modes of switches. Uh, maybe another kind of optimization, you could optimize uh, not to set separate cache flux, but send uh, request as uh, more, more volatile directly. Can you do that for uh, no, uh, uh, There are two questions. First, whether the device is, whether it is supported reliably, right. and whether the OS actually supports that mechanism. Yeah. I think it supports that, but it, it doesn't because there are no consumers. So it, it can be used with uh, DSS below support, so that uh, higher level we could not use because the method of DSLA and then it's possibly down to, to use. I 
And there's something similar for NV dimmed, right? Uh, an instruction to. So NV dimmed don't have a problem of, of synchronization in general. So everything is meant to run. Everything you wrote with them, there is already in there. Uh, Intel at the dev summit we had in the Bay Area a while back had a, a new CPU instruction for so there, something. There are uh, two ways uh, to, to, to write NV dimmed. Mm -hmm. You can write with after uh, you're done, you may request a speed of flash. Right. Or some hardware block form, if you, if you can support power for significant number of microseconds, milliseconds after power loss, it can do it in the hardware. Right. But it's better to not depend on hardware or physical hardware. Okay. So the model is working. Uh, mm -hmm. Another way is just to uh, write to NVD uh, through the cache running directly. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, thank you. Hmm? I was waving, it wasn't a question. Oh, okay.